Okay. All right, thank you very much, everybody. We're gonna get started now. Uh, my name is Judy Greenspan. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Center for Jewish History. Thank you all for coming out on such a hot, steamy night. I'm hoping that fall comes soon, but it hasn't yet. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk on the US Supreme Court with our guests, Linda Greenhouse and David Cole. So this evening's program is part of our series, Short Talks on Big Subjects. And I'm curious, with a show of hands, how many of you have been to any of the earlier programs this year? OK, good. This is nice to know. So for those of you who have not attended before, our series is produced in partnership with Oxford University Press and features authors of their highly regarded, very short introductions books. In a moment, Nancy Toff, Vice President and Executive Editor at Oxford, will say a few words about these short books, of which there are currently 576, with, <laughs> with many more in the pipeline. So Linda Greenhouse brought years of experience and much research to the task of writing number 306, the deceptively slim book you have now in your hands. Starting with the origins of the court, Linda explores how the court works, how it has evolved, and in 87 pages plus appendices, she provides readers with the tools to better evaluate and understand the Supreme Court today. Understanding how the past informs the present is central to our mission here at the Center for Jewish History, and now, with all eyes on the confirmation hearings and amidst much concern about the future of the court, we're delighted to have Linda Greenhouse and David Cole, the National Legal Director of ACLU, here in conversation tonight. But before we begin, I'd like to share a few words about the Center for Jewish History. So one more question. Is there anyone here who has never been here before? OK, good. All right. So for those of you who have not been here, and even for those of you who are, this is a world-renowned research institute for scholars of Jewish history. It's a destination for public programs, concerts, exhibitions, a place to explore your family tree, and most importantly, the center is home to our five partner organizations and their extraordinary archives. Our partners are the American Jewish Historic S Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Together, they possess a treasure trove of historical artifacts, documents, and other media that make up the largest repository of Jewish archival material outside of Israel. So just a few numbers to put that in some perspective. Our partners' combined collections include five miles of archival materials, 50,000 digitized photographs, 500,000 books, and span hundreds of years of history. So, of interest to tonight's topic, for example, you can find, let's hope this works, in the archives of the American Jewish Historical Society, a folder, good, containing this signed letter from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, along with a copy of the speech she gave at the Toro Synagogue in celebration of the 350th anniversary of Jews in America. It's a wonderful speech, and you can look at it online as well, where she talks about, quote, the age-old connection between Judaism and the law, the opportunities Jews found to join the legal profession in this country, and the first five Jewish Supreme Court justices. The very first, of course, was Louis Brandeis, and also here in the archives is evidence of his bitterly contested nomination. This is a news clipping from 102 years ago of a letter uh, President, uh, sorry, President Wilson wrote to the Judiciary Committee refuting the charges against his nominee and supporting Brandeis. He said, I have received from him counsel singularly enlightening, singularly clear-sighted and judicial, and above all, full of moral stimulation. So archival documents like these are accessible to anyone in this room who wants to come and visit our reading room where our librarians are available to help you dig into these wonderful resources in this building. But returning to our talk this evening, I don't think it's a stretch to use those same words, enlightening, clear-sighted, full of moral stimulation, when describing our speakers tonight. Linda Greenhouse covered the U.S. Supreme Court for the New York Times for 30 years, winning numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize in 1998 for her, quote, consistently illuminating coverage of the court. 
a groundbreaker early on. Linda was the only Radcliffe freshman her year who competed for and won a spot to write for the Harvard Crimson. In her latest book, Just a Journalist, Linda describes a career path which did not initially include ambitions to cover the court. However, after several years at the time, she was awarded a fellowship to Yale Law School. She earned a Master's of Study in Law in one year and took over the Supreme Court beat in 1978. At that time, Warren Burger was Chief Justice and the court did not yet have its first woman justice. Linda's 30-year tenure as a reporter on the court was longer than any sitting justice besides John Paul Stevens. She covered nearly 2,700 decisions and wrote some 3,000 articles before retiring from the Times in 2008. Since 2009, Linda has been the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law and the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence at Yale Law School and currently writes a bi-weekly opinion column on the court as a contributor write, contributing writer for the, time, for the Times website. In addition to her very short introduction book, she's the author and co-author of four more books. And interestingly, among her other areas of expertise, which I don't think we're going to touch on tonight, she's also an expert in horse racing and reptiles, which I find <laughs> fascinating. And in fact, according to an interview with her daughter that was published in the Yale Daily News, Linda, quote, knows horse racing statistics and her reptiles almost as intimately as she knows her court cases. So just a little aside. Now, I don't know if David Cole is interested in reptiles, but we are absolutely privileged to welcome him to the center tonight. Described by the late New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis as, quote, one of the country's great legal voices for civil liberties today. David is on leave from Georgetown University where he has taught constitutional law and criminal justice since 1990 and is the honorary George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy. In 2016, David was named the National Legal Director of the ACLU, the largest and oldest civil liberties organization in the country. He oversees the ACLU's U.S. Supreme Court docket and directs a program that includes approximately 1,400 state and federal lawsuits on a broad range of civil, civil liberties issues. When asked in a recent interview why he took the job, his answer was, I think it's an extraordinary organization. The ACLU is one of the civil society organizations that have played a key role in developing and changing constitutional law. I'm delighted to be now engaging one of, with one of the most effective organizations in the country on that very enterprise. It's a dream come true. David has litigated many constitutional cases in the Supreme Court, most recently Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. He's received two honorary degrees and many awards for his civil liberties and human rights work. He is the author or editor of 10 books, several of which, several of which have won awards. And his most recent book, Engines of Liberty, How Citizens' Movements Succeed, was published in 2016 and will be on sale after the program. So a final note before I step down, you all received pencils and note cards. And during the talk, we ask you to please jot down questions that you may have for Linda and David. I will collect the cards towards the end of their talk, and we will have the Q&A portion at the end of the program. After the program, I hope you'll join us for for a reception and a book signing in the Great Hall, where both David and Linda's latest book will be on sale. And she will also be signing your very short introduction. So our program will begin in just a moment, but first, Nancy Toff of Oxford University Press. Thank you. Welcome back to uh, fans of the very short introductions and new friends of the very short introductions. Well, when the series began life in the early 1990s, I'm sure no one dreamed uh, that it would be anything but short. Uh, it started as a series of paperbacks uh, called Past Masters, which were edited by Sir Keith Thomas at the University of Oxford. And these were surveys of the thought and writing of leading philosophers, political figures, scientists, uh, people like Aristotle and Darwin, uh, the standard cast of characters for Western Civ. In 1995, Oxford's UK office 
uh, rebranded the series as the Very Short Introductions, or in acronym land, uh, VSIs, and slowly began to expand the title list to include concepts and fields of knowledge, as well as people, Americans and Asians, as well as Brits and Europeans. We now have three editors acquiring into the series, and I'm happy tonight to update the box score. Uh, as Judy said, we have published 576 titles, although that might have gone up since I left the office at 4 o'clock. Uh, we will hit 600 later this fall. We have 109 more titles signed as of this afternoon, and another 489 on the drawing boards. We have an editorial meeting next week. I suspect that will go up. So one of the amusing parts of working on this series is reading the alphabetical list uh, that you will find in the front of every book and seeing the rather odd juxtapositions. So never fear, I will not read that list tonight. Uh, but in no particular order, I will point out just a few of the recent published titles. Um, now, as I said, in no particular order, the US Constitution, Decadence, the Harlem Renaissance, Military Justice, which just happened to be written by Jean Fidel, who is married to Linda Greenhouse. Uh, Saints, The Book of Common Prayer, The History of Childhood, Stoicism, Artificial Intelligence, Poverty, Autobiography, Southeast Asia, Native American Literature, and Veterinary Science. So one of my great challenges is to find the right author for each topic. Well, when it came to the Supreme Court, I confess that it did not take a great deal of imagination to decide who my first choice would be. I'd known Linda since we both lived in Washington many years ago, and I'd been trying for more than 20 years to convince her to write an Oxford book. The time was not right. So nevertheless, despite that, I dutifully polled the law professors and legal historians in my kitchen cabinet, and almost to a person, they said, don't ask me, ask Linda. So fortunately, this time, she said yes. And my really only complaint was that the manuscript was so nearly perfect when it arrived that I had no opportunity to show off my electronic blue pencil. And that is a problem I love to have. Now, I have to tell one story here, which is that when Linda finished the manuscript, uh, she decided to deliver it in person rather than simply emailing it. And it was a dark, stormy, slushy, blizzardy morning when she arrived in my office bearing gifts on time to the day. And she said, a deadline is a deadline. Well, when she left, one of our editorial assistants made a little sign, wrote, a deadline is a deadline, Linda Greenhouse, and posted it in the corridor where all the editorial assistants sit. I think it's still there. So now you will have the treat of hearing a relatively short but extremely thoughtful discussion between David Cole and Linda Greenhouse of the critical issues facing the court and the nation in the coming years. Thank you for coming. So uh, I, I'm uh, David. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I was here for the, um, the initial uh, uh, version of one of these talks. It was the uh, David Myers talk on a very short um, introduction to uh, Jewish history. So, you know, in, in, in comparison, I think, Linda, ha you had a relatively easy job. <laughs> Two centuries, one country, one institution. No, no controversy. Yeah. Um, but what, um, but what, Na what Nancy didn't say is that she first um, asked Linda to write a very short history of uh, reptiles uh, and then uh, <laughs> horse racing. But um, Linda demurred. So, uh, I, I, you know, like many of you, uh, I uh, grew up learning about the Supreme Court uh, from. Uh, from Linda. I think uh, between Linda Greenhouse and Nina Totenberg, most of us have, uh, that's what we know about the, uh, about the Supreme Court, two uh, remarkable uh, uh, women who have shed tremendous light on this, uh, on this institution. So uh, I'm delighted to be here in, 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 this, uh, in this conversation. Well, and I'm, I'm grateful for, to David for taking time out of his not only incredibly busy, but incredibly important role as the ACLU National Legal Director. Um, we're lucky to have him in that position. So thank you for 
being willing to do this. Thank you. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you know, know this, but um, uh, Brett Kavanaugh cited you uh, today uh, during, the, uh, during the hearings. Yeah, I was, I, I was on Metro North coming to New York from New Haven this morning, and I started getting emails. And I said, what is this about? So I gather he cited me. He, he credited me for the fact that he's, he's hired all these. That he's a feminist. Yeah, you he hired all these female law clerks. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. hey, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. We'll, we'll, we'll get to, uh, to Brett Kavanaugh uh, eventually. Um, but I, but he, yeah, I, I saw he, um, he basically credited an article that you wrote about the paucity of female clerks on the Supreme Court. Uh, essentially just as he was coming to the bench of the D.C. Circuit. And he said, well, that's wrong and that's unfair. And so then he set about uh, trying to change that by hiring uh, as many female law clerks as male law clerks, which is, um, that's considered affirmative action, I guess, uh, in, in the, in, in, given the history of clerkships. Uh, and then many of those, many of his uh, clerks went on to clerk for the Supreme Court. So he. He, he, he touted you as the reason that he is a feminist. Uh, 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 so, um, but as I say, we'll, we will get to Brett Kavanaugh, but we have 200 years of history to get through before we get there. So, you know, I, I thought I'd start with, um, with uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton's uh, uh, prediction or, or description of the Supreme Court as the least dangerous branch. and. Uh, and I guess, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, whether, why he said that and whether he, is, ha, ha, history has proved him wrong. Yeah, so of course the, the framers had only the vaguest notion of what a Supreme Court would do and had no idea of what it would turn out to be. Uh, in part, we owe that to John Marshall, not the first Chief Justice, but the fourth Chief Justice. Uh, who established the regime of judicial review, the ability of the court to declare federal statutes unconstitutional. Uh, whether that's what the framers had in mind? Well, um, of course, Marshall was part of the founding generation, so it's certainly what, what he had in mind. Uh, but it, it didn't become a really robust part of the court's uh, operating system for many years after that. I think there was... Uh, close to 100 years passed before, or maybe 50 or you know, many years passed before the court for the second time declared a statute unconstitutional. So uh, the, the court we have today uh, has traveled a far distance from the court that Article Three of the Constitution actually had in mind. So, do you, but do you think it's still the least dangerous branch? We know it's less dangerous well, than one of the branches. We have some pretty dangerous other branches. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, uh, today, as of September 2018, yeah, I think it is the least dangerous branch, but everything's relative. I mean, are, there, there's an argument that, that, that Congress is even less dangerous because it's dysfunctional. So it, it, can't, it can't do any harm because it, it can't do much good okay. either. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, David Kaplan, who's somebody I covered the court with uh, when he was uh, covering the court for Newsweek had just come out with a new book called uh, The Most Dangerous Branch, which is really a, uh, a rather vigorous dump on the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, I mean, all, all these ideas have some realm of legitimacy, I have to say. Right, but, the ba but, but, but in, in what sense is it, is it um, less dangerous? What, what are the, I mean, there are reasons, right, why the court is less capable of um, inflicting harm on the citizenry than either the president or Congress, right? So, Right, well, of course, that. the court, and I, I, I think many people don't necessarily have this in mind, um, the, there are limitations on the court's jurisdiction. So the court is limited to deciding cases and controversies. That means cases that are, that come from actual current disputes between two parties that have an issue at hand, an issue at, at, at issue. So no matter what the court thinks it wants to do, uh, it has to get the cases. Now I'm going to qualify that because we currently have a very activist conservative court uh, and 
populated by some justices who know exactly what kinds of cases they want and who basically put out an advertising brochure in the, ca in, in, in the form of, uh, of dicta, that is to say, not binding judgments, but words from them in cases, basically saying, uh, bring us the right case so we can do what we want to do. The case I have in mind is, I think, just about the most important case of the last term, the Janus case, that basically um, uh, derives from Justice Sam Alito's appetite for cutting the ground out from under public employee unions. It took him five or six years to get that case teed up. He asked for it. Cases were then basically cobbled up uh, as cases and controversies. So, you know, that was the court pretty dangerous, actually, um, especially given the fact that uh, state legislator, legislatures have been perfectly free for years, and about half the states have taken the option of not permitting, in fact, public employee unions. Uh, but those states headed by, in this instance, the governor, Republican governor of Illinois, who could not accomplish that through legislation because the New Illinois legislature uh, was not in his control, um, turned to the courts. So in that instance, the court uh, you know, was kind of a partner in, 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 in danger. Uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic process. Yeah, so I, I, I think one of um, Hamilton's notions was precisely that the court is, 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 is passive vis -vis, you know, as compared to the president or Congress. The president can decide to you know, do something, tweet about it in the morning and do it in the afternoon. And, and, and Congress can take initiative and take on a problem and act right by, by legislating, whereas the court, in theory, uh, ha sits back and just resolves disputes that come to it. But as, as you suggest, uh, you know, when you have a, um, when you have a well-established active political bar, uh, it's easy to issue invitations, which will then be taken up by, uh, by pu public interest lawyers or, or, or others uh, who will bring, bring those matters to the court. And so, you know, it's on the on one hand passive, on the other hand, it has so much power, and it can it can invite uh, um, uh, it can invite these decisions. But the other thing I think people talk about about the court being le the least dangerous is um, is that it has no um, uh, it has no army, uh, and it has no power of the purse. So the president has the army, God forbid, uh, and. Uh, and Congress has the, the ability to cut off funds for whatever it doesn't like. And the court um, issues its judgments, right? But if people ignore them, then what? Yeah, so what the court has is its legitimacy. The, what the court, what the entire judicial system depends on is our willingness to abide by the rule of law as articulated by our courts. And that's why, uh, to the extent that the court is inserting itself into political disputes over the future of organized labor and so on. Um, I believe I've written in recent months that the court is coming close to undermining its legitimacy, and we would all pay a, a, a high price for this. I think we we need our courts, obviously, um, and it's it's. Uh, it's, it's troublesome. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that the, um, the framers of the Constitution did to um, ensure that the court had the independence that they felt it needed to make hard decisions, the right decisions, what have you, uh, was to give the justices life tenure. So can you talk about that and sort of, you know, how you think life tenure has played out and whether you think, you know, what, what are the debates about whether we ought to have life tenure or not? So that was, that was a major innovation um, in, in our Constitution, and in fact, it remains an outlier in the world. In fact, um, of all the new democracies, well, some of them no longer so democratic, but that arose uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, that adopted um, a constitutional court system and so on, none of them 
have, gave their high court judges life tenure. Uh, I don't know of another judicial system that has life tenure. They all have either an age limit, as in Canada, or a term of years. Uh, it was, as David said, an effort to uh, preserve judicial independence, and to that extent, I think it has, it, it has done that. Uh, there's a movement afoot, there has been for the last maybe 10 or 20 years to revisit that. Uh, one theory being, and I think there's some justification for this, that it's life tenure that has helped to make our confirmation process as contentious as it is, because with life tenure, uh, there's so much randomness in when vacancies occur, and that makes each vacancy invested with you know huge stakes. So uh, President Carter had no Supreme Court vacancies, uh, followed by President Reagan, who named three people to the court and elevated Justice Rehnquist to the Chief Justiceship when Chief Justice Berger retired. So totally random, and there's a proposal to achieve either by constitutional amendment or by, some smart people think it could be done by legislation, impose 18-year terms, which would give every president two vacancies in a four-year term and would sort of regularize the process. So, you know, that could also have unintended consequences because every presidential campaign would then be elect me and here's who I'm going to put on the court, but we kind of have that already, so maybe exactly. that's not uh, such a downside. So I think, I, I think there's some problematic aspects to life tenure, and of course, uh, justices stay for a very long time. In some case, that's something that we all devoutly uh, wish would continue. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, it's iffy. Yeah. I, I have a conflict of interest because I'm married to a judge, so I believe in life tenure, uh, but uh, at least in, in her case. But um, but I do think it, one other effect it has right, is to ensure that the court is is very likely to be a conservative institution, right? Because it, the membership of the, of the court is never going to reflect today's politics. It's going to reflect the politics of some, uh, some generation or generations past in general. Um, uh, and, and is that your sense, that it has had that effect? Yes, it, it, it does, because uh, issues arise. I mean, for, my favorite example of this really was the, uh, what, what you might call the Rehnquist era of federalism revolution, where in the late 1990s, for the first time since the New Deal era, uh, the Supreme Court under Chief Justice Rehnquist started striking down federal statutes as unduly impinging on the sovereignty of the states, and we hadn't, using language that we hadn't heard for 50 or 60 years. And what was so interesting about that is that at none of the confirmation hearings for the people who were then seated on the Supreme Court had the issue of federalism even come up. It simply hadn't arisen in our domestic politics at the time that these people were nominated and all of a sudden there it was front and center on the court's docket. So there's, there's a kind of a lag time. Uh, uh, presidents obviously would very much like to be able to project their own constitutional vision onto the pages of US reports, the official compilation of Supreme Court decisions and uh, to some degree, they can sort of do that, but uh, but it's it's certainly not in their control because the political system will throw up all kinds of new of new issues. So, um, uh, in the time that you covered the court, um, I think it's accurate to say that two th th there's a phenomenon, right? One of the f one of the f um, uh, effects of life tenure and independence is that ju justices um, can change. They're not beholden to any particular, they're not necessarily beholden to any particular constituent, they don't have to run for re-election, um, they've got their job and it's the top job and they've got it for life. And so um, they can change and some of them do change. And one of the things that I th think is striking about you know, the last 40 years or so is how 
to the extent that justices appear to have changed, um, the, it, is, it is much more often that Republican appointed or conservative justices have moved to, to the center, have moved left, than liberal uh, uh, or, or Democratic appointed justices have moved right. I'm not sure which way is right or left. But, um, uh, you know, so, so if you think about, um, you know, in recent history, uh, Justice Stevens, a, a Republican appointee, Justice O'Connor, uh, Harry Blackman, uh, Earl Warren, an Eisenhower appointee, David Souter, uh, Anthony Kennedy, all of these were um, Republican appointees who, who became not, some of them quite liberal, Blackman, Souter, others uh, centrist, O'Connor, Kennedy. Um, but do you have a theory or, a, you know, uh, 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 as, to, as to why this is the case and whether it's just, it's just a contingency or, uh, or, or is there something more going on? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, for one, the, the caveat, of course, is the, the N is very small. Yeah. So whether there's any statistical validity to, you know, these small numbers, I, I don't know. But, uh, but certainly that's, that's the case. And there's been some interesting scholarship on this. So if you look at the Republican appointees, uh, say, from the middle of the 20th century to today, those who drifted left were uniformly people who had spent their adult lives until they went on the court uh, outside the beltway, uh, outside in the country, even if they were sitting federal judges as Justice Blackmun was on the Eighth Circuit, which is the Midwest, uh, Justice Stevens was on the Seventh Circuit, which is the Midwest. Uh, they come to Washington in, in midlife with certain ways of being, and their, their priors get kind of shaken up and the weight of being on the Supreme Court kind of may change the way they see the world, or so it would seem. The ones who have not drifted left or undergone what I guess political scientists call um, preference change or whatever uh, are people who were creatures of Washington. So think of, um, Clarence Thomas, who we know was from Pinpoint, Georgia, but he spent his adult life being a Washington bureaucrat. Um, think of um, Chief Justice Roberts, who, when he made the change from first being a, a star Supreme Court advocate to going on the DC Circuit, he had a change of venue of about four or five blocks when he, <laughs> when he went on the Supreme Court. Um, you know, he's not gonna change. Sam Alito, although he was a judge in New Jersey, not in Washington, basically, I think, never cashed a paycheck that wasn't issued by the federal government. Uh, so I think those are the life experiences that um, account for the way, the, the reasons some have changed and some haven't. So geography is destiny. This is not a good sign for uh, Brett Kavanaugh, who, who is an entirely a creature of DC, no, that's and suggests right. that, that uh, Neil Gorsuch is going to be the one that moves to the left, well, from, course, moving I mean, from Colorado. Right. I mean, <laughs> Neil Gorsuch was raised in Washington. I yeah, mean, he, yeah. you know, he, he was appointed from Colorado. But, um, but yeah, so of course, that kind of begs the question okay, if you're going to change, why do you change to the left and not to the right? Yeah. Um, you know, somebody might say, because progressive ideas are better. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, now I'm an opinion writer. I can say things like that. But, um, I mean, it, 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 is, it is really interesting. So, I mean, there were, again, the, the N is small. There yeah. are, there's a tiny handful of examples on the other side. Actually, I can only think of one, which is Byron White. Maybe you could yeah. think of another. So Byron White, of course, was a JFK appointee. Some people might say Frankfurter. Okay, that's a right. little, yeah. Yeah. He was a singular character, yes. I guess. <laughs> in many but, ways. But, you know, I mean, Justice White was one of the two dissenters in Roe against Wade. He dissented from 
the Warren Court uh, criminal procedure revolution, descended from Miranda, and he never really reconciled himself to those opinions, and he became, you know, crustier and more curmudgeonly uh, as he got older, and um, you know, others changed around him. So, you know, but that just might have been his own right. personality. So I think there, I, I, I think there are two two other possible things that go on, right? One is if the court is is sort of divided, as it has been fairly closely divided for a, a, a long time, um, from a personal perspective, if you move to the center, you become more important. So this, so we, you know, formally it's been the Roberts Court for the last 10 years, but it's actually been the Kennedy Court. Everybody writes their, wrote their briefs to Justice Kennedy, uh, tailored their arguments to, to Justice Kennedy, quoted Justice Kennedy as often as possible because he was the one who was most likely to swing either right or left. And that gave him a, a kind of power that the others don't have. That's, that's one. Uh, so by moving to, the, if, if it's a conservative majority court, there's some incentive for some conservative to move towards the middle to be, become more powerful. Um, and then the second uh, is that if the court is more conser if the majority of the court is more conservative than the country, and if the court's um, uh, power uh, rests on its legitimacy, uh, and and it can and it, and it consistently issues decisions that are more conservative than the country, it risks losing that legitimacy. And so there's some, you know, unconscious. I think the the one about being more being powerful is also somewhat unconscious. But there's some unconscious um, pressure to kind of moderate. If the country is to the left and the court is to the right, to bring the court you know, into, uh, uh, into line with where the country is and, and, and vice versa. If the court was 5-4 liberal and you had a conservative, if the court was 5-4 liberal and court was, the country was conservative, you might see one of the liberal members moving towards the middle to, if you, if you buy the premise, which is that the court's legitimacy turns in part on its capturing where the country is. Well, this is going to be a real challenge for Chief Justice Roberts because uh, it is the Roberts Court in name, and uh, he is a figure of history. He's well aware of that. He's a student of history. And uh, the most recent Gallup polling shows that for the first time in quite a long time, uh, more people say, the court is too conservative than say it's too liberal. That's a change within the last nine months or so. Um, so, you know, it's verging on, into that into that territory. And some people have said since Justice Kennedy's retirement, uh, well, now John Roberts will be the median justice, and we're going to see him kind of modulate to the middle. I think that's a little wish projection on the part of some people, a little facile. I'm not at all sure I buy that. You could say that the arrival of uh, uh, the first really solid conservative majority uh, in, I'm willing to say, despite the gray hair in the room in the lifetime of any of us, we're talking about the 1930s, um, that these five, conservative justices will be force multipliers for each other, will give each other aid and comfort um, for doing what they want to do, what they think is the right thing to do. Uh, so, but, you know, watching John Roberts navigate this landscape is going to be really interesting, really interesting. He's a, you know, smart, thoughtful person and uh, of, of deeply conservative instincts, but but also a deep instinct to preserve the legitimacy of the court. He's concerned about it. And um, I'm just fascinated to see what he does. Yeah, so, so you referred back to the 30s. And, and the, the, the last time that a court was sort of markedly more conservative than the country in its outcomes was the sort of the beginning of the 20th century up through the New Deal, right, with the um, 
uh, the response to the progressive era measures and the response to the New Deal. So talk about you know, what happened to the court then and what the, what the lessons are of, uh, of that period. Well, of course, we had the Depression, and we had FDR as president, and we had these innovative, very federal government-centered uh, New Deal programs that uh, he and the overwhelmingly Democratic Congress were putting out there. And we had a Supreme Court that, one after the other, was declaring them unconstitutional. Um, so that was the crisis. And of course, FDR had this idea of the so-called court packing, adding new justices to replace those who had aged out. Um, or adding not to replace, to, in addition to those who had aged out. And, and uh, Congress rejected that particular idea, but it, it, it galvanized the country and, uh, and led some justices to modify their views and to resign and gave Roosevelt a working majority of the court that then lasted for a, long after his life. And so um, Justice Douglas, who was an FDR appointee, um, uh, stayed on the court until the 1970s. Um, and Justice Hugo Black stayed on the court until the in 1971 or so. Um, so that was a response to uh, the, not just the perception, but the reality that the court in the New Deal days was wildly out of step in its vision of the role of the federal government in the life of the country. Yeah, and, and, I mean, it was so much so that when the, uh, when the, ACL, the ACLU was founded in 1920, um, and so it was founded at, at this time when the, the Supreme Court the, essentially the only constitutional rights that the Supreme Court recognized were the rights of corporations and businesses uh, to um, not be constrained in how they treated their workers and their con consumers, right? It was, they were striking down consumer protection laws, striking down wage and hours laws, striking down working conditions laws, all as interfering with the rights of, of, uh, of big business. And that was constitutional law. And so when the ACLU was founded, um, it, it really thought there was no point in going to court. In fact, the first legal director of the ACLU was quoted as saying in that period, um, we can never expect justice from the courts. It's a pretty radical statement, but at that time it was true. But, but as, as you described, the, the, because the court was, was so out of uh, whack with where the people wanted constitutional law to be, it really created a crisis of legitimacy that um, that led to at least to a threat of court packing and led to a shift, and, and not just a shift on uh, worker protection laws, which the court you know, then basically um, said were fine, but also a shift to uh, recognizing individual rights in a much more robust way, right, as seeing, seeing their, their role was not to interfere with economic legislation, which is what they had been doing before, well, then what are we going to do? Um, well, we can protect vulnerable groups, minorities, um, uh, dissidents, and the like. And that's, it's only then, right, that you see the rise of um, real, you know, or the beginning of the rise of uh, First Amendment protections uh, and uh, equal protection and, and the like. So, you know, there's hope. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think it's the case, and, and actually I, I, I say in, in the book, that the court is always in dialogue with the rest of the country and with the other political institutions. Uh, it's not maybe always obvious. It's not, a, it's not an overt dialogue, but um, there's, a, there's a push and pull. And um, I guess it was, it was the great political scientist, Robert Dahl, who said, over time, the court aligns itself with the I forget exactly the words he put it, but with the, the sentiments of the ruling elite in the country, uh, that's actually, um, you, can, you can understand Roe against Wade, actually, in that, in that frame. Um, so, you know, to the extent that, for instance, and I'm a little obsessed with the Janus case, the, the uh, labor union case, because it, uh, it crystallizes, it stands for so many things that are going on with the court right now, but it comes along just as 
the labor movement, certainly in the public sector, is revitalized and, and gaining ground, not losing ground. And then you have a Supreme Court that's going in the other direction. Um, that's a source of tension that'll be extremely interesting to see how that plays out. So this is what when I say to people when they when they say, well, you know, now that we're going to have five uh, very you know strongly conservative justices on the court, what can we do? I think what we can do is politics. What we can do is do what we can to ensure that the uh, the 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 country uh, you know stands for civil liberties and civil rights and if they do and for economic justice and if they do that will limit the ability of the court um, to do the uh, the damage that it might otherwise feel free it's, it doesn't act in a vacuum it, it, it and it doesn't act simply because of you know briefs filed on either side or or even priors of the justice they 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 have to be responsive to the to the country. Yeah, you act in politics. Uh, I mean, constitutional law is made not only by judges. Uh, constitutional culture is created in broader uh, society. Uh, and we have 50 state courts uh, that some of which, I mean, state courts have the ability to interpret their own state constitutions. They can't give fewer constitutional protections than the Supreme Court. Uh, than the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the federal constitution, but they can give more. And a number of them have. And that itself creates a set of constitutional expectations that find their way in, into the culture. So um, you can't emphasize enough the kind of dynamic nature of uh, the making of constitutional law. So. Um so we're here at the Center for Jewish History. So um, can you say a little bit about the first Jewish justice, whose picture we saw at the outset, and uh, well, you know, to what extent his Jewishness was an issue and, 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 or not in, uh, in his uh, selection, his confirmation? Uh. Yeah, so you know, we've had contentious confirmation hearings in, in, in our lifetime, but few of them uh, amount to what was done to Justice Brandeis. Uh, President Wilson nominated him. He was, at the time, probably the most famous lawyer in America, um, the people's lawyer, uh, invented life insurance, uh, did all kinds of fascinating uh, uh, progressive uh, pro-consumer uh, things. And he was deemed uh, by really the establishment of the country, including at that time former President William Howard Taft, uh, to be unqualified, to be too radical, to be not up to the job. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee actually held a hearing, which they had not previously done. Uh, he was uh, you know, vilified. Um, and it, I mean, there's no doubt that it was because he was Jewish. Um, and I think uh, there was a gap of some four months between his nomination and his confirmation, which was exceedingly unusual in those days. So, um, so you know, that was that was the story. And uh, it's just it's very fascinating that, of course, I mean, after Brandeis, there, there was a notion of a Jewish seat on the court. There was a notion of a Catholic seat on the court, for that matter. Justice Brennan was the only Catholic on the court for most of his tenure. And to the extent that that has fallen away, and of course, as everybody knows, there's three Jews on the court now, and um, soon to be six Catholics. Um, Justice Gorsuch is an Episcopalian currently, but he was raised Catholic. Uh, you know, and how did this happen? Um, well, you can understand how the Catholic appointments happened because that was seen as a proxy for justices who would overturn Roe. Um, but three Jews on the court, um, you know, it's just very interesting. So seen against the, the history of anti-Semitism that came to the fore in the Brandeis nomination, um, it doesn't seem to be something that, uh, at least at that level, uh, the American people care about. Yeah, there's, there's no seat for the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Well, that's a shock, right, given, given the history. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and do you have a sense of, 
uh, where this court is uh, likely to lead us on the religion uh, on the religion clauses, establishment clause, and free exercise. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's um, the establishment clause is hanging by a thread right now. Uh, I mean, the I think the singular case that shows me how much of a thread is hanging by uh, was actually an opinion by the majority, a five to four majority opinion by Justice Kennedy a few years ago, a case called Town of Greece, which was a challenge to the um, uh, expression of Christian prayer before town meetings in this town in upstate New York. And the Second Circuit here had declared it unconstitutional as a violation of the Establishment Clause. The Supreme Court reversed that. And Justice Kennedy said in his opinion, basically, well, you know, we're all grown-ups, and we all have to put up with speech that we don't necessarily like, and basically just uh, put up with it. And the Constitution has nothing to say about that. Um, so I think there's, there's a desire on the present court to both um, cut way back on the Establishment Clause and on the free exercise side to elevate the role of religion in the public square. Um, there's an interesting case pending right now. It, the court has not yet accepted it. It's a case that they'll look at uh, when they come back uh, for the new term and decide whether they want to take it. Uh, there's a 40-foot high cross that stands, I'm sure you've seen it, uh, in, in, uh, right outside Washington, D.C. On, on Bladensburg Road. Uh, maybe it's, yeah, it's in, it's in Montgomery County. Uh, that was erected as a World War II memorial in, um, I mean, sorry, a World War I memorial in about 1920 by the American Legion, but it's now publicly owned by a public park commission. And the uh, Court of Appeals down there declared it unconstitutional as a violation of the Establishment Clause. And there's a whole lot of people that have come in as amicus curiae um, telling the court to take up that case and reverse that opinion. And it's, um, I think it's an invitation that the court, this court will find hard to resist. So uh, watch that case. It's called American Legion Against um, American Humanist Association. Okay. Great title. All right. And uh, watch, watch that space. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think uh, the religion clauses are going to be an area of active litigation for the, for the next uh, uh, significant uh, uh, period. So um, I, I wanted to just have you reflect a little bit on your career. You, you, you covered the court for 30 years. And I wonder, in, in what ways did uh, you know, the court change from you know, day one on your job to the end of your uh, uh, tenure? And what, in what ways did that change your job? And did, did covering the court change? Over that 30-year period, or was it, you know, or, or did you sort of, were you essentially doing the same kind of work in the beginning as, the, as at the end? Okay, so that, those are really two questions yeah. in one. So I'll give, I'll give uh, two answers. So, I mean, one way in which the court changed. So I started covering the court in 1978, and I left in um, 2008. Uh, one thing that changed in that time, and my my students. Uh, find this hard to understand because they've come of age when it was just taken for granted that it was four votes here and four votes there and Justice Kennedy in the middle. That wasn't the case. <laughs> when I started covering the court, there were uh, three or four justices in the middle, depending on the issue, and anybody who had a case before the court couldn't just aim it at one justice, but really had a broadly appealed to the bench because there were uh, a number of justices. Um, I could name Justice Stewart, comes, comes to mind, um, who you really had to appeal to. And you had to assume that, you know, they, you would have a fair chance of getting the vote, uh, no matter what, what the issue was. So, so, you know, that changed. It changed kind of gradually. I mean, first it was it was the O'Connor court. Remember, she was the justice in the middle. So that that was just a change in the basic dynamic of of the way the court operated. So that's the answer to your core question. In terms of covering the court, the the internet actually changed a lot. I mean, when I first started covering the court, it sounds like you know the Pony Express days. So you could only 
get the opinion of the court in real time by being physically at the court and getting a copy of it. I mean, that we're talking before most people even had, you know, like a fax machine. So part of my job was to get two copies of everything. I would bring them back to the office. I had one copy to work with, and the other copy would be put on a bus that would go up to New York, <laughs> and somebody from the New York Times would go to the Port Authority building <laughs> and pick it up from the bus and take it to the editorial page, which in the fullness of time would decide what it thought. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so early on, I realized that I couldn't call some expert, some Supreme Court expert out in the country uh, to ask that person uh, what I should think about some new development because I had the opinion and that person didn't. Mm -hmm. So that person was going to tell me what to think, filtered by how I described what had just occurred. So early, early in my reporting life, I started just becoming very self-reliant and figuring, you know, I basically knew as much as all these experts, but whether I did or not, I had the opinion and they didn't. Uh, so of course, by the time I left, um, the, core, the opinions are up online within minutes of being issued, the transcripts are up online the same day of the argument. It used to take, well, you couldn't actually get the transcript. For, for important cases that the Times wanted to run a transcript, we had to separately contract with the, the court's outsourced transcription agency to actually buy it, and they charged by the page, and it was very expensive, so that didn't happen too often. Uh, you could find um, the filings on, on, online. Now the court, just this past year, actually, now the court puts up all the petitions and all the filings online, which is amazing, just amazingly useful to anybody that cares about the court. So, so te the technology changed. But the last thing I'll say about that is, it gave me, um, at a certain point, and I, I write about this in uh, the book that, my latest book that Judy mentioned, which is kind of a memoir called Just a Journalist. I had a sort of a crisis of, like, what's my role in life uh, around that time? Because I figured anyone who really cared about the court could get the opinions with a push of a button. Why do they need me? You know, what's the point? And then I, you know, kind of thinking this through over a period of time, realized that the point was they needed me for context. Where did this case come from? Why was the case there? Where was this doctrine going? What's the deal? You know, what's the dynamic at, at issue here? Uh, so I figured, well, I still did have a role, even despite the fact that you could sit in your comfort of your armchair and you know, learn all these things about what was going on uh, at the Supreme Court. So that was, that was a change. And, and didn't the volume of cases that the court took change quite pretty dramatically from when you started oh, to yeah. today? Oh, yeah. No, when I started, the court was deciding about 160 cases fully on the merits with signed opinions every year. That doesn't sound like a lot of work, but that was just a nightmare. I mean, the month of June was just crazy with... And now, now it's how many? Now, I think this last term, I think it was 63, right? Yeah. I mean, still the big cases tend to come out at the very end of the term just by human nature, uh, you know, save, you know, you've got a deadline. But um, uh, yeah, that's been a big a change in quality of life, I would, I would say. So, um, so Kavanaugh, uh, the Kavanaugh hearings are going on. Do you think the hearings um, make any, serve any function, and if so, what? Well, I think these hearings do serve um, for one thing, I mean, the Democrats don't have any running room, and Judge Kavanaugh will be confirmed, I certainly assume. So what the Democrats are doing is setting down some markers. You know, history's going to judge this period. And what are the voices that are going to be available for historians to, to hear? So the Democrats are trying hard to do that. Uh, I also think there's an educational function to confirmation hearings in that the senators and they're sometimes clumsy, but sometimes I think very sharp and to the point way. I commend to you uh, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's uh, questioning of Judge Kavanaugh uh, this afternoon. 
we get to know what the Senate institutionally cares about. What are the live issues? You know, I mentioned before, federalism hadn't come up, you know, but, uh, you know, what's, like, what's on their mind? And it's kind of the last chance the Senate will have to speak to the nominee, assuming he's successful and becomes a Supreme Court justice. And so I think the, the Democrats, anyway, are trying to just kind of you know, nail down in Brett Kavanaugh's mind, uh, the court's at an important turning point. You're going to hold an extremely important position on the court. You will be conservative number five. Uh, you may be holding the future of the Supreme Court in your hands. Uh, take that seriously, Judge Kavanaugh. And, you know, his demeanor is appropriate. He's hearing them. You know, what, you know, what this means for his future behavior, who knows? But it's, you know, I, I get the feeling there's a kind of a dialogue going on. I'm not willing to, to write it off. He's more forthcoming. Well, anybody would be more forthcoming than Neil Gorsuch. I think I wrote in a column that you, I got better answers from Siri on my iPhone than the senator. <laughs> <laughs> Senators got from Gorsuch, and um, uh, you know, the the dialogue with Kavanaugh strike. I think strikes me as somewhat different. You, you may have you watched any of it? Do yeah, you? Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I would you agree with it? More substantive. Yeah. 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 So you know, it's it's not, even though the outcome is foreordained, it's I think it's not a useless exercise. Yeah. I did think the Gorsuch thing was totally useless. Yeah. So in terms of talking about outcomes that are foreordained, one of the concerns that's been articulated by um, many who are concerned about the Kavanaugh nomination is the future of Roe versus Wade. So. Do you have a, you know, a prediction about that? And, and to what extent does the, dis, the court's decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was the last time they expressly considered whether to overturn Roe versus Wade and look like they had the votes, right? To what extent, what does that tell us about what we might expect? Well, of course, it's so first, the- first, maybe we should say what happened in Casey. And, yeah, so Casey, 1992, um, so that was 19 years after Roe. Um, you know, modified Roe gave the states uh, the ability to protect unborn life from the moment of conception instead of just after viability and so on, and, and our, uh, set up this undue burden standard, So, uh, which leaves a whole lot of judicial discretion. What kind of burden is undue? There's raging controversy among the various federal courts. For the Fifth Circuit, in which Texas is located, uh, no burden is undue. Every burden is just fine. Uh, the Supreme Court, in an opinion two summers ago, Whole Woman's Health, written by Justice Breyer, joined by Justice Kennedy, said actually this Texas law that would close three quarters of the abortion clinics in Texas, that is an undue burden. So that's the court's last word on abortion. Um, I think with Justice Kennedy gone, uh, that case would have come out differently. Uh, do I think the Roe Casey regime itself will be consigned to the dustbin of history? Um, uh, actually, I would not be surprised. Um, again, I, I'm obsessed about the Janus case. That was so activist yeah. and so in your face. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, on the other hand, you know, they can do a whole lot of damage to the right to abortion without actually pulling the trigger and, and engendering the political blowback that there would certainly be. I mean, Sandy Levinson, wonderful law professor from the University of Texas said years ago, Roe is the gift that keeps on giving to the Republican Party because it's always there as an issue, but it's always there. So, uh, so I don't know, but but the 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 right of um, poor women to abortion is under serious threat. I think the you know middle class women among us will find a way to safely uh, terminate uh, pregnancies that they don't want to carry to term. But it's a it's a serious crisis already for um, 
women in, in poverty and without access to resources. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, I think in, in, in one sense, the, 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 the Casey story sort of um, is hopeful, right? Because there you had, you, had, you had five justices who had questioned seriously the legitimacy of Roe versus Wade. And that you had a, an administration that was actively arguing that it was illegitimate and it should be overturned. And, and, and they, the court blinked. And Justice um, Kennedy and Justice O'Connor uh, joined up with Justice Souter and, and wrote an opinion that said, we're going we're gonna to you know, we're going to preserve the core of Roe because of stare decisis. We're not going to overturn it. But at the same time, but then it's also, a, you know, it's also a kind of cautionary tale because they, they rewrote Roe in preserving it and, as you say, adopted this standard called undue burden, which is, you know, uh, virtually meaningless and, and suggests that a conservative court doesn't really need to overturn undue burden. They can just see you know, fewer and fewer burdens is undue. Well, that's right, and there's a lot of cases in the pipeline that are put there just to test how far the court will go. Right. Uh, very concerted litigation effort, and you know, we've got these um, states, Louisiana, uh, Nebraska, these states that are tossing up this, these um, bills that are basically written by uh, this outfit in Chicago called Americans United for Life. You can go on their website and you can see the model legislation and you just have to fill in the name of your state and uh, get your legislature to pass it. So uh, we won't have long to wait to see what actually, uh, what's actually gonna happen here. And how about affirmative action? Well, uh, Kennedy was the last vote standing to preserve affirmative action. And I think part of, part of uh, Chief Justice Roberts' project uh, in coming to the Supreme Court was to get rid of it. Um, it's impossible to read the parents involved case, which was not an affirmative action case as such, I, I point out, but it was a case about uh, the extent to which government can take account of race. Um, and also uh, the Shelby County case, the case that um, destroyed the Voting Rights Act, both written by Chief Justice Roberts, both for five to four uh, courts. And, um, and so that's the project. And uh, uh, Kennedy drove his conservative colleagues nuts over the Fisher case, the University of Texas case. That's why they re-granted it a second time to, after the remand to try to uh, put the squeeze on Kennedy, and he didn't quite play with them. But um, uh, so, yeah, I'd be, uh, I, I think affirmative action days are limited. And then we have this, you know, horrible case going on with, with Harvard and the Trump administration coming in. And, uh, you know, what there is to say about that is it's not a case about Harvard. It's not a case about Asian American students. It's a case about, it's a chance to get at a lead higher education uh, as a whipping boy uh, and to destroy affirmative action. So, um, you know, that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, so um, Judy has been collecting your questions and I'm gonna try to uh, read them, which is a challenge for me, but... Um, um, Why do you think um, Justice Kennedy resigned before the midterm elections? Or do, even under Donald Trump? I do not believe in, these, in the liberal conspiracy theories about this. I totally don't believe them. Um, he resigned because he's 82 years old and tired and not very well. And, um, and that's the, I think that's all there is to it. Uh, um, do you think, I mean, there were rumors that he was ready to retire when everybody, including Donald Trump, knew that Hillary Clinton was going to win the uh, election. And that his, and then when Trump won, he kind of had a moment of uh, second thoughts. He hired up more clerks. His kids um, uh, prevailed on him to stick it out. Well, and you then, know, I mean, this, it's, being a Supreme Court justice is 
we see objectively is a very hard job to walk away from. And that's why they stay. And I think he just reached a point where he was just going to go. Um, so that, you know, I, I don't have a deeper explanation for it. Uh, this is a question for, for me as much as for you, but please outline how far reaching the Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, ruling actually is um, uh, and has deeply held religious beliefs um, been codified yet? I'm not sure what that means, but. The, so, you know, oh, David, oh, yeah. David argued Masterpiece Cake Shop. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, uh, well, I'll tell you what I think about Masterpiece Cake Shop. I mean, you know, we, so the ACLU represented the gay couple. Um, people, for anyone who, who wasn't reading the papers, this is the case about the... Um, the baker who wouldn't bake. Yeah. Right. The, uh, the baker who would not uh, make a cake for a gay couple for their wedding because he opposed, um, his, his religious beliefs opposed um, uh, same-sex marriage. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, in, in, uh, we, we, we say uh, is that in, that in some sense we won the war, lost the battle. Because the, the claim in the case was that you have a First Amendment right. If you object, if you are engaged in an expressive business, and this was masterpiece cake shop, so it was expressive, <laughs> um, and you object to what it would express to serve somebody, uh, the state can't require you to serve that person because it is then compelling you to speak, compelling you to express a view that you disagree with. That was their argument. Their secondary argument was if it's compelled by religion, then it's also a violation of your free exercise rights to require someone to do that. And um, they, they, Masterpiece Cake Shop and though the, the group that represented them did, did not win on that uh, claim, right? The, the court. Um, did not rule for them on that claim. And in fact, the opinion is filled with very strong language. It says that your philosophical or religious objection to abiding by a neutral non-discrimination law is not a reason for failing to abide by that law. And, uh, and if it were, uh, then we would have businesses across the country saying, you know, we don't serve uh, gays and lesbians, we don't serve Muslims, we don't serve Jews, we don't serve blacks, and any business that could characterize itself as expressive would have that right. And so there's this very bro broad language about how that, that's just unacceptable. And that was really what we were seeking to win. But they didn't rule on that ground. They ruled on the ground that in this particular case, this particular commission, uh, a, which adjudicated the claim by the gay couple against the baker was itself infected by religious bias. Uh, and that religious bias independently violated um, the, the free exercise clause, violated the Constitution. And so the baker won, but he didn't win the right to um, refuse to make cakes for gay couples. If he goes back into the business of making wedding cakes, he still has to make a cake for a gay couple. All he won was the right not to be tried by a biased tribunal. So we haven't heard the last of this. So there's now um, a, a transgender person who asked this baker to bake a cake. <laughs> celebrating uh, his or her uh, transition. And of course, he's not going to do that either, uh, A. B, um, there was, at the time that the court was deciding the Masterpiece case, another case awaiting their decision, a case called Arlene's Flowers, which is the florist who won't flower for <laughs> A same-sex wedding, and what the court did was send that case back to the, is it Oregon or Washington, Pacific Northwest? Yeah, I think it's Washington. It's our case. I think it's Washington. That's also your yeah. case? Yeah. yeah. So uh, for reconsideration in light of Masterpiece Cake Shop, now, as David explained, there's nothing in Masterpiece Cake Shop to enlighten us on that case because it doesn't have the easy off-ramp of a commissioner who spoke the truth, but the court deemed it improper. Um, 
So that case will come back up, and they'll have to decide the florist claims. Of course, the expression of, you know, my, my flower arrangements are an expression of my artistry, and I shouldn't be made to do this uh, to celebrate um, something that's against my religion. So uh, the court minus Justice Kennedy, we'll see what they do with that. Yeah, the, the argument was um, quite remarkable in this because when the, when the lawyer for the baker and the lawyer for the, for, the, for the Solicitor General who was supporting the baker were up there, um, all of the court's questions were, how do we tell what's an expressive business from what's not an expressive business? And so you got all these hypotheticals. And basically, when you're a lawyer up there before the Supreme Court, you want to win your case and you want to say, you know, you can rule for my client without, you know, upsetting the apple cart too much. And so the lawyer for the baker wanted, wanted, to, wanted to distinguish everything other than baking. Baking, clearly expressive. Uh, but she, you know, she was asked about, what about, uh, um, what about makeup artists? Um, uh, uh, she, Justice Kagan said, what about makeup artists? They have artists in their name. Surely they're, she, oh no, they're not, they're not expressive. What about, what about then, then Justice Alito was trying to save her and she said, well, what about architects? Assuming she would say, well, of course, yes, architects. She said, no, not architects are not expressive, uh, to which Justice Breyer said, you mean Mies van der Rohe is not expressive? Uh, and then when the Solicitor General got up there, you know, his distinction, he wanted to draw a distinction between the Safeway wedding cake, I don't know how many of you got your wedding cake at Safeway, but, but he wanted to make a distinction between the Safeway wedding cake and this wedding cake. This one was expressive, that one wasn't. How do we know that? Because, and I quote literally, I'm quoting him, because the, the, the baker's cake here was highly sculpted and cost a lot of money. <laughs> so that's what the First Amendment protects, highly sculpted, expensive things. So that's the problem with their theory, which is that there isn't a way to, you know, almost anything, uh, almost any conduct, almost anything can be expressive in, in one way or another. And so it's not a, a coherent, they don't have a coherent theory for carving out an exception that wouldn't, you couldn't drive a truck through. And I don't think the court's ready to drive that truck. That's, you know. But Trump, you, you wrote a, 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 a something about the, the difference in the court's reaction to, you know, to two big religion cases of this term were Masterpiece Cake Shop and uh, Hawaii versus Trump, the Muslim ban. So the, the, Muslim, the Muslim ban case, um, yeah, where the president had been articulating uh, all these obviously anti-Muslim uh, reasons for banning adherents of an entire religion from our shores. And the court was, had been so sensitive to um, the words of the Colorado commissioner who had simply said that uh, in, in her opinion, religion had been uh, uh, unfortunately invoked as a cover for religious bigotry. Um, the court didn't seem to have too much of a problem with that in the Muslim ban case. So. Bigotry, I guess, is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. No, it was remarkable. I mean, I was in the courtroom for both of those cases, and the the, the there was the court. The number of the justices were visceral, clearly viscerally disturbed by this statement of this low-level civil rights commission member in Colorado. Who well, this is what she said: I think it's despicable when people um, invoke religion to harm other people. You know, she shouldn't have used despicable, just like you should not use the word deplorable. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's actually constitutional law that you can't invoke religion to inflict a harm on another person. And, yet, and they were so upset by that. And yet when the, that by some low level, you know, civil rights movement, yet when the President of the United States makes, you know, virulently anti-Muslim statements, eh, nothing we can do. So you know the question is 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 that is it is the distinction president gets to be anti-religious, uh, you know civil rights commission members don't, or is it you can be anti-Muslim but you can't be anti-Christian? Uh, or you know I mean to, to just play devil's advocate, you've got you know the national security national security rationale in a body of law that says uh, you know we defer to the president, so. Um, it was an unfortunate case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, 
can you say, please comment on uh, Judge Kavanaugh's opinion uh, in this year's, in, in the abortion case that he did rule on, which is the, uh, the Jane, uh, Jane Doe, uh, unaccompanied minor seeking yeah. an abortion. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure I suspect people know about this. This was the um, unaccompanied minor uh, undocumented immigrant um, in the custody of uh, the ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, headed by um, extremely anti-abortion activist uh, bureaucrat, uh, whose view was that uh, basically to permit an outside agent, uh, somebody acting on her behalf, to um, help her terminate this pregnancy by having gotten her before a judge who said, yes, you're mature enough to make this decision. I, you know, I, in, in lieu of your parents, um, you know, I grant you the right and set up an appointment and so on. Um, they wouldn't let her out of the shelter in which they were keeping her, so she had to go to court. And the Trump administration's argument was, um, even though the government wasn't being asked to lift a finger or spend a dime on this, it would uh, the, the government could not be uh, forced to quote facilitate uh, providing an abortion for this uh, unfortunate young woman. This goes up to the D.C. Circuit. Uh, two judges on the panel say, yes, of course she has a right. Uh, she, she can exercise her right to abortion, and um, Judge Kavanaugh, dissenting, said, no, no, uh, not so fast. We have to give the government at least another 10 days. This is a young woman who's by that time 16, 17 weeks pregnant, coming right up to the line when uh, abortion in Texas for anybody, and she's located in Texas, uh, will come up against the ban in Texas against abortions that I think 18 weeks. Um, Kavanaugh says, no, we need to give her another, uh, you know, 10, go, give the government another 10 days to find an outside sponsor. The government had been looking for a, quote, sponsor for weeks or months uh, for her and for everybody else. And, you know, it was, anyway, it was a horrible uh, situation. So he was asked about that today at the hearing. And I didn't actually watch that part, so I'm just reflecting what I read as a journalistic account of what he said. But evidently, he said, well, of course, had she been an adult, uh, she would have had an absolute right to abortion. And the, my only point was she was a minor and uh, you know, needed to, this, this decision needed more consideration. And the senator who was questioning him said, well, wait a minute, she had already gone before a judge who said that she met the Texas uh, qualification for being a mature minor who had the right to make the decision for herself. And I don't know what Kavanaugh said in response to that, but uh, I think they just kind of moved on. So what I've you know, written about this is I found that a, a very telling um, move by him to kind of buy into the government facilitation argument, which is preposterous. Uh, and also, in his separate opinion, he referred several times, he used the phrase abortion on demand. That is the ultimate dog whistle in discourse about abortion. What do we mean by abortion on demand? We don't have you know, an appendectomy on demand. <laughs> we don't even have a facelift on demand. You know, it's a medical procedure um, designed to solve a problem. And uh, anybody who uses the phrase abortion on demand is in conversation with uh, that side of the street that is very problematic um, for that person to be on the court. So I, two more questions, and then we should break, because um, we're, we're at the end of time. One question is about the. Um, the change of tone in the court's writing over the period of time that you were on the, uh, covering the court. Oh. I think the answer to that is two, is, is one person, right? You know, it, it's, it's Justice Scalia, yeah. Um, right, but 
I'm not sure Justice Scalia was, you know, the first justice to be nasty to his colleagues. And um, he, he and was the best at doing that. He was, well, you know, in our in our wired age, he got a lot more notice for it. But yeah. um, uh, so no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually have much to say about that. Yeah. Um, and then the last question, a, a, a number of people asked this question, which is, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're careful readers of the Constitution, this crowd, and they've noticed that, the, uh, the, that Article 3, which describes the court, does not specify how many justices need to be on the court. So when Elizabeth Warren is president, uh, uh, can, can, uh, can we increase the size of the court by, say, you know, Two or three. Yeah, I mean, there's some. I've you've seen read these op-eds. You know, why not just add justices so that it's you know. Uh, nothing, un nothing unconstitutional about it. No, I mean, uh, there's been as few as six, and at least on the books, as many as ten. I don't think there ever were ten seated, but not only there were ten. Um, you know, I mean, I think this sort of takeaway until recently anyway from the failed court packing plan was uh, don't do this. Uh, now people are talking about it. I think, um, you know, that remains theoretical, but theoretically it's possible, yes. I think it's highly, highly theoretical. I, and and the, the reason is, I mean, FDR was a popular president. The court was a deeply unpopular institution, and it was at a time of major crisis in this country. And even then, um, uh, you know, there was, there was some significant pushback to the notion that you're going to add justice to the court in order to change the composition of the court in a political way. So. Um, not likely. Well, I, I, I want to um, thank uh, Linda uh, for uh, enlightening us on the history of the court. And thank we'll see you. you all in the back. <laughs>